Cambridge Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Graham. And I'm very grateful to Cambridge Muslim College for, for the opportunity to collaborate with their marvelous work. <clears throat> well, um, um, if you allow me, I will mostly try to read from this, because otherwise, English not being my mother tongue, I tend to start stammering. And it, it can prolong things. So <clears throat> I will start, as he was doing, with a few uh, words on, on terms. Of course, basic terms, because there's some Chinese uh, names. And I know there are some Chinese speakers in the audience. So allow, please, apologize, apologies in advance for murdering the pronunciation, and also with some Arabic terms <clears throat> I will be using. When we speak of martial arts, we are often translating the Chinese wushu. Wushu. You see that around sometimes. And in, in it's quite a close translation. But I have met some Chinese friends who wonder at the use of the word arts there. Why art? Wushu, why art? And <clears throat> these, uh, they're puzzled because, uh, because of so the evolution of the word in English. The, we have a sort of problem with the word art in English, which has come to be used almost exclusively for museum art, for what we call the fine arts. <clears throat> and this normally means, or very often, novelties and abstract things, sometimes quite absurd. The, the best characterization I have heard in general of, about this topic was here in Cambridge by Ahmad Killer, who is also a friend of Cambridge Muslim College. Highly recommended his talk on the character of modern art. <clears throat> so to understand the expression martial arts properly, uh, it needs to be made clear that we speak of art in a more traditional sense of a craft. What is a craft? A craft is the transformation of suitable and usually noble materials at the hands of an expert initiated craftsman into something that will reflect the harmony of the cosmic order. And that's why it's so beautiful. The, the product. In martial arts, as in true craftsmanship, the transformation involves simultaneously the material and the artist too. And the material in this case is not only the closest possible to the artist, of course, but it is also the noblest possible matter on earth, namely the human body conceived as it is by traditional medicine and other disciplines, as a marvelous microcosm, a little universe, which exceeds by far what our, our current materialist anatomy and physiology teach us. Well, let's go back to the basic terms before we return to this transformation later on. In most cases nowadays, when people in China speak of wushu, they, as in the Olympics, it, at some point, <coughs> did it made it to the Olympics and it, public events and so on, they usually refer to acrobatic displays, to a particular set of circus skills which resemble outwardly true martial arts, but are limited in their effects and in their combat applications. Another important word uh, here is Kung Fu, very, very popular. And as it is frequently used by Chinese speakers, it refers in general to Chinese martial arts, Kung Fu, everything, it's a, yeah, Kung Fu. Uh, sometimes people are puzzled to find out about Tai Chi Chuan. You see very slow, and then people wonder, is that Kung Fu? Yes, that's Kung Fu too. Um, well, more about that later. Uh, originally, this word Kung Fu only means proficiency. So we can have Kung Fu in any activity. 
where we put our effort. Kung Fu is like saying a PhD in something, real specialization. Master Su Yu Chang, from whom I have learned and, I'm, and I still learn martial arts, he likes to translate Kung Fu as time and dedication. Another important word we have is Qi Kung. Qi Kung, also very popular nowadays, it has the same Kung element, Qi Kung, uh, which means work, effort. And this Qi, at the beginning of Qi Kung, um, is what we call sometimes vital energy. It has to do with the breathing. So Qi Kung can be translated as work of the energy or work of the breathing. And it refers to Chinese traditional exercises to improve and maintain health. And sometimes also to treat specific diseases or develop a particular strength. So today, um, as we normally do, I, I, I will be using the terms Kung Fu and Wushu as synonyms. Meaning traditional Chinese martial arts in general, and including also Qi Kung because um, all uh, real martial arts always include qigong. There are no movements that carry, there are no movements in real kung fu that don't carry energy. There's always an internal work. Um, martial arts movements are always qigong movements. That is, they necessarily have an impact on integral health and well-being. In martial arts, sometimes also called higher martial arts, Wu Yi, there are no ornamental movements, just as the concept of ornament is foreign to our traditional craft. The movements are by nature beautiful and healthy at the same time and effective. Now, coming to the topic of the talk, uh, there have been historical relations between particular styles and lineages of Kung Fu and Chinese Islamic communities. Some of the most important teachings in our own school, Pachitang Lang, and teachings related to the, one of the styles that gives name to the school, Pachi Chuen, it's a little known style, very old. Um, and in a style that uh, is renowned for its real life applications and its very effective use. These, some of these uh, teachings have come to us through lineages which include prominent members of Chinese Muslim minorities. This was so even as recently as the beginning of the 20th century. And it does not mean that these styles were in, in any obvious way Islamic but simply that there was no distinction between students and teachers of different religions, very much with the character of, uh, of the approach of the Chinese culture to, to religions. But today, I'm not going to speak of any historical relation, but uh, about a more internal or essential relation between Islam and martial arts. So let me come back to this transformation I mentioned just now. <clears throat> when we say that the artist himself is transformed as the matter he is working on, into what is he transformed? And how? How is he transformed? Well, if we follow that craft comparison, it must be, as I just said, into something that reflects the cosmic harmony. But wait, aren't we already that? Aren't we already something that reflects the cosmic harmony? Or are we not? Or how are we that? At this point, as in every manifestation of Chinese culture, a Taoist concept is central. The most common expression of the aim of human life in Chinese culture is being like an infant, a baby. But we have grown up, we have acquired language and plenty of habits, especially bad habits. 
Another Chinese way of expressing the same aim is to say, return to what is natural. And the natural is a conventional translation for a cryptic metaphysical expression. Xian Tian, before heaven, prior to heaven, the former heaven. So what is natural? It seems at least odd, when not outright contradictory, that in order to arrive at the natural, we are asked to undergo such exertion, sweating and all that, stretching. Isn't it more natural to sit in the sofa, munching and watching something? It certainly feels more natural to lie on a couch and being served than to sweat in the kitchen. Doesn't it? Or to take a hot bath. Doesn't that feel natural enough? Why take a cold shower instead? It is the same situation in which we find ourselves, the fitra, our original nature, feels in most cases far from what we would think of as natural in a profane sense of the word. Living up to the fitra takes a lot of self-discipline, zuhd, a lot of muraqaba, a very subtle and constant attention to our inner life, and a lot of muhasaba, a meticulous reckoning of all our movements, internal and external. So if we try to reconcile this exertion with the divestment, divestment has become a term in finance, meaning you sell your stock, you sell your things. But originally it means to um, unclothe to shed your clothes, take off your clothes. So this divestment, in order to become a baby again, like peeling off layer after layer of our fallen nature, this which is required to return to infancy, brings us to the very first and crucial practice in the learning of martial arts. It's very difficult. And it is called in Chinese, Fan Sung Ran, relaxation of the body, seeking the original nature. It's quite remarkable, as you may have experienced, and as we shall later on, I think, experience when we do a little practice, how difficult it can be to simply relax and let go of our customary daily levels of tension. You see, even here, I'm like, why? I can just uh, relax, let my shoulders sink, it's so much better. All the time we're living like that, with this tension in the back, everything. The practical results of achieving even a moderate level of relaxation are an improved breathing, and in general, a sort of opening through or in Chinese medicinal terms, the re-establishment of a proper flow of vital energy through the body. Two images from the Islamic tradition come to mind in relation to this process, this relaxation to allow for the original nature to come up. First is how when we surrender our will to the prescriptions of the religion, we open ourselves to the divine mercy and grace, as in the tradition reported in the Ihya, Ihya Ulumadin. Man kana lillahi kana Allahu lah. Whoever is for God, God is for him. Well, or different translations. The key Arabic term relating to this idea is tafriq, an unloading, an emptying which is mentioned immediately before this saying in the Ihya. It is all about emptying the heart of its contents or worries. The second image, it's this famous tale found in Rumi's Masnavi about the contest between the Chinese and Greek painters. It's 
It's not a good story from the Chinese point of view because they lost, but what can we do? The, the Greek painters in this story succeeded by simply polishing and polishing their wall to the point that it became the purest mirror without any trace of rust or speck of dust on which the Chinese marvelous work of art was reflected but was, looked even more beautiful and alive than the original painting. Still to this day, the formal adoption into a lineage of martial arts usually involves the bestowal of a very special mirror, rather archaic, archaic in design, exclusive property of the disciple, a symbol of his own soul. All the above mentioned effort turns out to be one of self-noting, as it was called in the Middle Ages, clearing the house in a demanding, unstable balance between exertion and relaxation. It's very paradoxical, ceasing to be ourselves to be ourselves. One of the many associations in this regard is the famous methodic rule of the medieval alchemist, solve et coagula, that is, let go and gather, or concentrate and dissolve, or in the Arabic, which was always such an important language in alchemical literature, qabd and bast, contraction and release. This is a very methodical reference. So now moving forward, in a little summary of this talk, which you have probably read, I mentioned violence and peace as a puzzling contrast between the arts of war and the religion of peace. It may be now a lot clearer what that relation is. In order to impose peace on the soul, the believer exerts himself and this to the point that there is some breaking, as in the expression, to break the two desires, Kasr Shahwatayn, title of one of the books of the Yahya. And in the exact same sense as we speak of breaking a horse. There is another Arabic expression which combines very well the two aspects we are viewing. Afraga <coughs> Jahdahu literally something like to pour out his effort, meaning to do your utmost. In this expression, we find a combination together, the emptying and the struggle. This reminds me of a young English poet in the early 20th century, who would later on become a very venerable Muslim in his old age, and who spoke to the muse the divine inspiration, offering to pour himself out in her service to the lees. You know, the lees, in, it's like the dregs, the solid sediment that is left at the bottom of a bottle or a jug. We can see it, it's an everyday reality. So he spoke to the muse about, he made this promise of pouring himself out in her service to the least, and that means to the last drop and more. <clears throat> so next time you see the solids that lie at the bottom of the bottle, remember that is the measure of our effort, our jahd. This is precisely what we do. We pour ourselves out in his service to the least, an emptying, purging struggle. And then the second step in learning Kung Fu is something called Shen Chin Pa Ku, stretching the tendons and joints to allow the energy to reach every part of the body. So, whereas the first one sounds less active, the relaxation, the second one is this stretching, a lot of stretching, all the joints. <clears throat> They say people who practice this grow, grow taller. So my master used to say when he, in China, rich people 
would buy their coffin long time before their death to make sure it's the quality they want and it's an excellent coffin. He, but he said in his case, not only he didn't have money to, to be doing that like the rich people, but also because he practiced this Shen Chin Paku in the martial arts, he shouldn't do that because, because of the continued practice. If he bought the coffin at some point, then at the moment of his death, maybe he would be too long for the coffin and they would have to saw holes at the ends of the coffin. So. <clears throat> so in order to practice this stretching, this very special stretching, we need to familiarize with a certain configuration of key points through the body. The junctions that act like nodes upon which we shall work. This configuration is like learning a geometry of the body, a new anatomy, and it is not unrelated to the well-known diagrams showing the paths of acupuncture meridians. So you see, we have now specified a little more what is this effort we shall work on. It is an effort to change our body through some very specific movements in order to change our unnatural ways for the real nature hidden within ourselves. Oh dear. Our real nature is so hidden that it feels at the beginning as quite foreign and quite paradoxically unnatural. But also, at the same time, there are always hints from our soul from our original nature within, that resound more or less enthusiastically when they are confronted with the divine revelation. Otherwise, why would we care about beauty? Why would we care about nobility or sacrifice? It is because of the real nature within us, which wants, most often dimly, undecidedly, to break through our false nature. And this is also why it is possible to enjoy the work, to enjoy the path, to enjoy the discipline. It's not all about suffering, really. Uh, I gave this to read to a colleague and dear friend in our school. And he said, oh, you, you surely have suffered a lot practicing. It's not about suffering, really. <clears throat> because of this real nature within us, we, are, we can enjoy, even when we are doing things that are so contrary to what are called the pleasures of daily life. So when we talk of um, working on our bones, you see this stretching even to the bones, even to the bone marrow as some famous exercises offer to do, we are certainly attempting to do some violence to what we are used to seeing as our constitution the way we are. This violence I speak of, you see, has nothing to do with some um, rather misled practices that are, you see a lot on, on YouTube and everywhere about breaking bricks with the hands and that kind of thing. That has nothing to do with real martial arts um, or, or very little, if at all. <clears throat> so this violence goes inside. There's sure, there's for sure, Kung Fu is, a, is an art of war, an art of, of fighting. So there's all that dimension. And, and if you practice Kung Fu for a long time, you become a weapon, really. In some countries, people register them with the police and so on. They say he's a weapon, so he's registered with the police. I don't think they do that here. <laughs> so there's all that dimension. But the, but the violence you can do physically is really a very little thing and of, of no account really compared to the real violence that we have to do in relation to our habits <clears throat> and our name and all that. Uh, the, the question, this is a famous question in English, is can the leopard change its spots? So the answer, of course, is no, oh, the leopard is like that. But I dare say, if the leopard practiced Kung Fu, it could change its spots. So 
you see that shows you the kind of violence we are speaking of here. It, like, it's like outgrowing itself, you see. Um, well, we don't have much time. I think, to be fair, we started a little late. <laughs> so let me just go on for two or three more minutes to round this here. <clears throat> so a little more specifically now, as we prepare for our brief practice session, and coming back to this new anatomy I just mentioned, there are five key aspects which are always involved in martial arts and which we shall be exploring during our practice. One, breathing, to calm the mind spirit and to put in order the energy. Two, body weight or balance. How you move your weight around. Hmm? All this. To help blood circulation, to relax the tendons and strengthen the bones. Sometimes also body weight you stamp is learning how to use all your body weight. Three, movement of the hands to guide the internal energy and to feel the external energy. Fourth, difficult to translate, form of the trunk, this upper part of the body, to change the temperament of the body and increase stamina. And this involves awareness of five places which are normally neglected in all sorts of modern sports and exercising and fitness training and all that. These are the sternum, this bone here, the diaphragm, shoulder blades back here, the coccyx at the end of the spine, and the rib cages, the sides. Do you never hear anything about that when you do some physical training. It's very, but it's important in Kung Fu training. <laughs> and finally, mindfulness of the eyes to unify spirit and ideas in the internal with the external. So this is an easy way to tell good Kung Fu from bad Kung Fu. You can go to any school. You see, if people, people are instructed on how to direct their eyes, then that's, that's thorough training. Otherwise, it, there's something lacking, you see? And it makes complete sense when you think it's your attention. So, and actually, it makes complete sense in a combat situation. You're not going to be punching here and looking at the other side or kicking. No. The eyes go with the movement. So, Given this ambitious little program of nature-seeking practice, I think I'd rather conclude this talk now. Um, before we finish, I would like to ask you, I recently, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go and visit Master Su, who is now in Spain. And he's rather ill at the moment, unfortunately, so I would like to ask for your prayers for him. Remember him in his prayers. He has been very faithfully transmitting all this knowledge for many, many years, about 60 years now, and done a lot of good work, especially in the West, uh, in the Americas and in Europe, to transmit this uh, ancient knowledge. 